The Library of Congress National Book Festival is coming up. Our children's read this year is Fighting for Yes, the story of disability rights activist Judith Human, Written by Marianne Kokoleffler and illustrated by Vivian Mildenberger. We sat down with the author Marianne Kokoleffler as well as her daughter Janine Leffler, who inspired Marianne's disability advocacy and writing. They also co-authored the book We Want to Go to School, The Fight for Disability Rights. In this interview, we talked about Marianne's writing and research process, Janine's experience as a disabled person growing up and writing, and this year's book festival theme, Books Build Us Up. To learn more about the great reads representing Maine and about the authors, head to mainehumanities.org. Hi, I'm Marianne Coca Leffler. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for inviting us. Um, I am an author illustrator of children's books. I currently live in Portland, though I grew up in the Boston area. Um, and today we're going to be talking about several of my books, all of which have something to do with disability or disability rights. Um, one being Fighting for Yes, the story of disability rights activist Judith Human. And with me today is my daughter and co-author of another book. Hi, my name is Janine Leffler. I'm from Portland, Maine. My pronouns are she or her, and I am the co-author of We Want to Go to School, The Fight for Disability Rights. What inspired you to write Fighting for Yes, the story of disability rights activist Judith Human? When did you first learn of Judith Human and her story? Wonderful question. Well, uh, backing up years, uh, the reason I decided to write a book on disability rights is because I was inspired by my daughter, Janine who was born with disabilities. So I have been her advocate uh, for close to 40 years. And um, seeing the discrimination and the bullying and the exclusion um, in her life as growing up and just many things that caught my attention, I started um, studying the history of disability rights. And when I did that, um, I got very interested, being an author illustrated, to get that information out to kids. So the first book I did was with Janine, and we'll talk about that later, called uh, We Want to Go to School, The Fight for Disability Rights. And that book is about an unknown landmark case in 1972, which ensured public school education for kids with disabilities. But while I was researching that book, uh, one name kept popping up, and that name was Judith Human. And I was just surprised, like, I didn't know about her. And the more I read about her, I read her, um, her biography, her memoir called Being Human. I also watched uh, the documentary film called Crip Camp, both of which um, are about Judy. And then I realized that she was instrumental in disability rights. And the biggest thing she did was fight for um, 504. And um, so she led the 504 sit-in in 1977. That being said, I, I was shocked that no one had written a biography, a children's book biography about Judy. So I began piecing together her life which begins in 1947 up to present day. Um, and we can, we, I'll talk more about that process, but that answers your question of how I found Judy. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was sort of a path. Yeah, I think it's great that you were, you know, the first person to really uh, distill her um, life down into a way that children could be inspired by it because, I mean, she really, her, her life as a child really informed how she became the activist that she is now. So I really appreciate yeah, and, that. And obviously you read it, and um, as did everyone at um, the Maine Humanities Council, and so you, you can just see the discrimination that laid before her. Mm -hmm. um, and it was heartbreaking. What was the research process like for writing this book? And what was your process for making this into the right size for young audiences? Perfect question. My process in this book, um, I should mention, I'm sort of new writing nonfiction. Okay. And um, we want to go to school. 
was my first nonfiction book about disability rights. So both of them sort of have the same path. I just read everything I can about the, these, um, this time in history. But, but in Judy's case, I just gobbled up um, anything I could find, newspaper articles, film, of course, her biography, um, legal documents, legal history. Um, so it took me a good year to gather that information. This was a challenge, is gathering a year's worth of research, funneling it down to a 40-page children's book. So I really had to find the essence of the important parts of her life that told the story in a simple way, but was factual. So I would say that was the really big challenge. Once I submitted it to Abrams Publishing in New York, um, they loved it right away. But then it hit me. I cannot write a biography about a living hero without reaching out to Judith because I was so in awe of her and the last thing I wanted to do was mess it up. So my publisher then got involved and um, spoke with Judith's agent. And Judith's agent sent my manuscript to Judy and luckily, I'm so thrilled that Judy took the time to read my manuscript and vet it, and I let them know I was totally open to changing the manuscript. I wanted it to be perfect. Well, um, we made that connection, and I was so thrilled. And she read it, she loved it. She found a few things which was sort of interesting. The few things she said, ah, oh, you know, um, you know, when I first went to school when I was 12 or whatever, um, I wore a green dress. And the, she was looking at the illustrations, by the way, at this point as well. And it was really a special green dress. So I'm like, sure, the illustrator will definitely change the color to green. Uh, there was also one instant where um, she was home because she couldn't go to school because of her disabilities. And she just watched her neighborhood kids go to school. So the illustrator, of course, which was a good idea, uh, put her at a window with the bus going by. And she said, well, the, the kids didn't take the bus. They walked to school. So these tiny details we have, would have never known. So the illustrator was gracious in redoing that illustration. Um, but the biggest thing she asked me was, Marianne, don't make me look like a hero. And that sort of floored me because I'm thinking she is a hero. But she was so much um, about giving other people credit. She says, I could not have done what I've done without others. So she wanted to make sure, and I changed the text to honor her. And in the end of the book, I have um, a lot of back matter. And I, with her guidance, mentioned the people that she wanted to mention in her life who was side by side with her through her journey. Um, so I was so grateful again when Judy agreed to write a note in my book to my readers. Sadly, uh, Judy passed away three months after the book was published, um, really shockingly unexpected, um, which gives me even, I'm even more grateful that I got to connect with her and and she was part of this biography for kids. So the whole process was just just wonderful. Yeah, I'm so glad that you got to connect with her before she passed. I mean, that the timing of that is so yeah. profound, you know, um, that's, that's incredible. Um, Janine, can I ask you a question? Sure. Janine, you wrote a book with your mother, We Want to Go to School, The Fight for Disability Rights. I'm so interested to hear about the process of writing a book together. What was fun or easy about writing together? What challenged you? Okay, so um, when my mom first told me we were writing a book about disability rights together, she called me up one day when she was researching and she told me that... Um, before 
this law was passed that she was writing the book about in 1972, kids with disabilities were not allowed to go to school. I'll get into a minute what my disabilities are. If I had been born 15 years prior to the to when the bill was passed, then I would have not been able to get the services that I got in order for me to thrive. In the book, I basically introduce myself and my disabilities, which are cerebral palsy and a vision impairment. When I grew up in the 1990s and early 2000s, I went to school um, and I got a lot of services for my disabilities to help me to thrive. I got physical therapy, speech therapy, which is why I am such a good public speaker, <laughs> and um, occupational therapy, basically to help me be able to be able to fit in well with the rest of my peers. Um, I mean, um, I think the best thing about writing this book with my mom was the educate was the knowledge that I gained about this law that was passed in the 70s to allow children with disabilities to go to school because before we wrote the book together I didn't know anything about it at all yeah I, I'd imagine that that probably um, wasn't something that you talked about in school no we, I mean in 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 school, we definitely learned about the civil rights movement, like with Martin Luther King and stuff, but we never knew any, we never learned anything about disability rights. And I wish that we had, because that way I could have learned about Judy, Judy Human when I was growing up, and I would have known a lot about her before my mother wrote her book. But I hope now that my mom's book is out in the world. Um, about Judy Human, that people will be able to be more knowledgeable about disability rights. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, another thing Janine touched on that she was surprised to know um, that prior to 1971, kids with disabilities couldn't go to school. I was floored by that. I had no clue. And uh, one thing that's interesting, the law that she's referring to um, from the book, the book is about a law um, which is Mills versus the Board of Education. And um, what's striking about this book was it was based in not Washington, D.C. Seven children with disabilities and their parents, these kids were not allowed to go to school. They brought the case and said, we want our kids to go to school, hence the title. Um, so what happened was it was a class action suit 18,000 kids from Washington, D.C. Were, were also home because they were, not, were unable to go to school because of their disabilities. So that just floored us both when I realized there were 8 million kids in the country sitting at home not going to school. So this case, which ended up passing and, and resulted in um, a law, the law was finally signed in 1975 by President Ford, which allowed kids to go to school that have disabilities. But, so anyway, we're off on a tangent with that, but. Um, no, but that's such um, fascinating information to know, especially when you think about how much the civil rights movement for racial justice is taught in schools. Uh, often disability rights in general are left out of curriculum entirely. They have been. Yeah, yeah. Another striking detail, and I, I, I know we'll, we'll talk about this later, but the fact that the um, American with Disabilities Act was not passed till 1990. So there was like almost 20 years between this case and, and the, the um, ADA. So it's slow going. Fighting for Yes takes us through many years of American history. At a turning point in the story, we're in the 1960s when students are protesting the Vietnam War, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is leading the civil rights movement, and the Stonewall Uprising is also taking place during this time. Can you speak to the importance of diversity and intersectionality of the disability rights movement and how it influences your writing? Well, there was definitely an intersection because during the 60s, as you mentioned, there was a lot going on. There was a lot of movements um, and, and people protesting. In 1971, when that Mills case was going on, I had, um, I should mention, I had connected with the last surviving lawyer on the Mills case. Oh, wow. 
And, and he's noted in my book, and he wrote a note. And I said to him, I said, I'm doing research on the Mills case, and I can't even find a newspaper article. I said, why is that? He wrote um, a document, a legal document, and, and called it The Quiet Revolution. He said, Marianne, the reason it was called The Quiet Re Re Revolution was there was no one protesting. People did not want their kids to go to school with, dis with disabled kids. So not only were they not backing these parents, they were against them. So there was no, um, there were no marches. There was no support for, for that case. Luckily, by the time Judy stood up in 1977 for the 504, people were coming out and really supporting them. So, so that's one thing that I should mention. 60s were great. That got, that got the ball rolling. Um, I do think, according to history, but I'm not an expert, 1980s, we sort of slipped back. Publishing was also very uh, behind the times, trying to embrace disability. I have been doing children's books for 40 years, just as long as, just almost as long as Janine has been here. I have tried several times to write books where the character was a disabled child or on disability. And over the years, I got loads of rejections from publishers saying, there's no market for these books. And I'm like, no, no, people want to know this stuff. And they said, well, no. So after so many rejections, something happened. Um, Black Lives Matter happened. Me Too happened. Um, Calls for diversity and equity happened across the board. And that was between, don't hold me to it, around 2013 to 2000, um, maybe, yeah, maybe 2020. So during that time, publishers took notice. And all of a sudden, I sold my first book, which was Janine, based on a differently abled child. And that was 2015. Publishers then were um, publishing diverse voice, voices across the board, including um, t people that were disabled or about the topic of disabilities. So that is when all these books started to get published. So it's not like I hadn't been trying for all those years. So what's happening in the political spectrum or what's happening on the streets and the voices um, is finally impacting um, publishing. Yeah, it seems like it's a, as much as it is political, it's a cultural shift that we're going through, and that is influencing how publishers are seeing what's marketable. Right. And, yeah. Well, let's hope, because we all know about the, the other side, which is banning books. Right. Ugh. Of, all, of all these voices I'm talking about, people are out there against a lot of books by, you know, queer authors or people of color or any, they don't want it out there. So we all have to, you know, and I'm sure the Maine Humanities Council is fighting it as well. Um, so let's hope we continue um, to have, you know, knowledge, all knowledge uh, being published. Janine, what is it like to be writing a book that's so close to your own experiences and identity? My goal in promoting the book with my mom about disability rights is to encourage people with disabilities and also their peers to advocate for stuff that um, makes them worried about the future, like especially in this current election year that we're in. I think it's really important that everybody votes, including people with disabilities, because all voices need to be heard. And um, another thing I like to encourage when I go to the schools is for people to just be themselves and not be afraid to do that. In the book Fighting for Yes, Judith Human goes to Camp Oakhurst and dreamed that someday the whole world would be a world that included them. Have you had a moment in your life where you experienced a small utopia or feeling of euphoria that made you want to change the world? So the reason why I moved to Portland was because I 
got hired by Vertical Harvest Farms, with this, which is opening in Westbrook in the fall. And what Vertical Harvest is, it's a hydroponic indoor greenhouse and 50% of their workforce will be people with developmental disabilities. And the great thing about Vertical Harvest is that it is encouraging people in an underrepresented workforce to apply for jobs and encouraging them to get into positions that will fit their skills. Like that's the biggest issue I had in the past with jobs. Like the reason why I wasn't successful in certain jobs was because like either it was um, like dexterity issues with cutting things or trying to open boxes or lining things up on the shelf so that way they're straight because of my eyesight. So what Vertical Harvest is going to do is they're going to fit a position to my needs and my goals so that way I can succeed. And that's what I really like the best about them. And I can't start, I can't wait to start working with them in a few months. We've been um, connected with Vertical Harvest since I saw a documentary about them like three years ago. And they are in Wyoming and they're expanding. And as Janine said, their model, it's called the Grow Well model, is to hire 50% of their staff um, with people with disabilities. So that was so thrilling to me. And I'm so excited that you know Janine will be working for them because it's a community. But bigger than that, Vertical Harvest is going to be a leader and hopefully show other companies to open up their workforce and consider hiring people with disabilities. That is the, one of the biggest um, issues right now. Once kids uh, with disabilities reach 21, they fall off a cliff. There is no place for them. And they're, they're un either unemployed or underemployed. Um, so this is what needs to change in society. But your question about was there a euphoric moment that made me want to change the world. I'm going to twist that upside down because what made me want to change things was not the euphoric moments, but it was the moments of frustration. It was the moments of seeing um, Janine being bullied as she grew up, the moment of her not being accepted. Um, and so that is why writing these books is so important to me, and that's what puts the fire in me. I hate to say it, it's the frustration um, of this inequality. And it's not over yet. We made so many gains and Judy paved the way with the American with Disabilities Act, but I don't think people realize that discrimination still goes on. And there's one that most people don't know is that Adults with disabilities who want to get married can't get married. And the reason they can't is because if they get married, they have a huge risk of losing their uh, benefits, which they really need. The good news is that there is a bill on in, in Congress right now called the Marriage Equality for Disabled Adults Act. Unfortunately, it was introduced in 2022, and it has been sitting there. Um, who knows what's going to happen, but it's been dragged and dragged out. So we're no closer, but at least it's at, at least it was introduced to Congress. The National Book Festival's theme this year, Books Build Us Up, explores how reading can help connect us and inform our lives. It's through books that readers can develop strong bonds with writers and their ideas, relationships that open the entire world, real or imagined, to us all. What books have you read that built you up? This could be from when you were a child all the way up to your most recent read. How do you hope Fighting for Yes will build up your readers? I have, an avid reader. I am. So I, 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 I have, so I have two books written down that I wanted to talk about and another one that I forgot to write down that I wanted to mention. Um, the first one is called Learning to Fly by Ali Stroker. So Ali Stroker, for those who don't know, is a Broadway actress who won the Tony Award in 2018 for playing A. Do Annie in the Oklahoma revival. And she wrote a story, a middle grade novel about a 
young girl who is in a wheelchair and in a community production of Wicked, she basically encouraged me more to still continue to stay involved in theater because during COVID, I went through a bit of a slump because of theaters being closed. So that's what I really like the best about that book. The second book that I had written down that I wanted to talk about is called uh, Mighty by Emily Gillespie. Emily Gillespie is a neurodivergent author who just recently, I don't know how recent this book is. I feel like it came out a couple of years ago. It's basically a series of essays by people who have disabilities relating disability to superheroes, which as a person who's a disability rights activist and a fan of superhero movies, I liked how this combined both of my favorite things into one. And the last book that I wanted to mention is a romance book by Abby Jimenez called Yours Truly, which I have read twice. And the male main character in this book has anxiety, which is another disability that I have. And Abby Jimenez really did a good job um, talking about coping mechanisms that you can have to deal with anxiety and also going to therapy. So I really applaud her for that because it's one of my favorite romance books that I've ever read. Beautiful. I love Good your train. enthusiasm for books. It's so <laughs> lovely. <laughs> between, between the books and the Broadway plays, yeah. that's, that's Janine's two favorite things, right? Yeah. By, I like to read biographies about people that have changed the world and, um, and that are strong, strong characters or strong people that saw injustices. And just a few would be um, Ruth um, Bader Ginsburg, uh, of course, Judith Heumann, you know, Michelle Obama, um, President Obama, people in that realm. Uh, a novel that I just read, we both read it, um, was called True Biz by Sarah Novak. Uh, it was a book, she is hearing impaired, and it is a book, uh, a novel um, about the deaf culture. And it just it was an eye opener to me. So I would, very, I would suggest people, people read True Biz. Well, my, my hope about my book, Fighting for Yes, is to have kids be more empathetic, um, to try to understand uh, other people, where they're coming from, uh, to see injustices and to try to do something about it. Of course, to, to be kind, to be inclusive. Um, and kids really react, you know, to this book. And they have so much empathy. I really think we're in good shape with the, with the kids coming up for our future. Um, but I would like to end, or at least um, end this portion, with a quote from Judith Human, and this is the end part of her note that she had um, kindly uh, put, uh, put together for, for my book. We, disabled and non-disabled people, are changing the world. How will you start to fight for yes? Are there things you think need to change? Do you or any of your friends experience discrimination? Talk about your feelings and find ways you can work together. Fighting for yes starts with you. And of course, she's speaking in the book to young readers, but I think those words are for absolutely everyone. We have to get together and we have to fight for yes. Oh, 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 oh,